So let's talk screens, big, beautiful screens. And in this case, buttons, so many buttons, who knows what to do with all the buttons. You could also be uh, maybe sim racing from the couch. Love the setup. Did this for years myself. And uh, boom, there's your, your 4K TV. Maybe you've convinced the wife that you can have the storage underneath the stairs. Great spot for a sim rig. I mean, we all dream about the corner office. Another good opportunity for a, a monitor. I think that one's 4K. I'm not sure. As far as triple monitors go, you can even mount them to a moon lander. What is this thing? But anyway, we all know that the best place for triple 4K monitors is from the cockpit of your very own race car because nothing is more sim than re real. Okay, joking aside, here are my triple screens in desktop mode, work mode, but I am showing an iRacing replay and let's talk specifications. How important is the CPU when running triple screens? iRacing has their system requirements on their official webpage. These are outdated, five years old, hard to even find a four core processor these days. Most things are six. Uh, a lot of the top end processors are still eight or more cores. Does that matter? We're going to look at that today. Up first is a processor that I found that um, represents minimum spec. This is an AMD Ryzen 7 2700 eight core processor. You can't buy anything new that is as slow as this. this. This is legacy hardware and a good benchmark for what it would be like to upgrade from five-year-old technology. Also released in 2018 was the ninth generation from Intel. Here is a 9700K, overclocks extremely well, and I think it'll show well in today's results too. If you saw my previous video, you'd be familiar with these six processors. On the left, we have the Titans of today, two of the fastest on the market. 14th gen Intel is the same performance. In the middle, we have basically the six core mid-range models. And then on the right-hand side, we have the 5600, what I think to be the uh, entry level for uh, sim racing. And beneath it, Hall of Famer, the 5800X3D. And yes, I know my left monitor is not level with the other two. Let me tell you, getting these suckers perfectly straight is not easy. I use the same settings for all of the CPU testing. And I have certain settings on here that are explicitly testing the CPU. I did not use NVIDIA Surround. I used iRacing's monitor settings shown here. And here is the shared hardware that was used, plus simple tuning and the software versions. So let's start with Daytona. I did a VR CPU performance video. If you haven't checked that one out and you're interested, go find it. It's the only other video I published. This is a grueling CPU intense replay. We've got 50 cars on track, four cockpit mirrors, headlights. It's intense and it'll push all of these processors. Only one lap, the first lap of data was captured for the benchmarks. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop that replay up here and show some results, starting with the minimum a Ryzen 2700. Before we get into the graphed results, let's talk monitor resolution. So in here in this column, you can see what we're looking at. Um, I think it's actually more beneficial to see this in millions of pixels. Keep in mind that a normal 1080p monitor is only 2.1 million. Uh, so ooh, triple 4K is huge. Here are a couple examples of the ultra wide QHD. Uh, one from Sam Samsung, one from Gigabyte. There's a bunch of brands competing uh, in this size. And the performance numbers here will be very similar to uh, 2560 by 1440 resolution. Beneath that is 4K ultra wide HD. This is a, an Odyssey G9. Um, there's a few other monitors that are like this. Basically, it's two 2560 monitors side by side. And finally, the last three are just your standard triple monitors, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. But take note that 
triple 1080p is actually less pixels to push than 4K. So when we become GPU limited in benchmarking, the triple 1080p monitors will be easier to drive than the single 4K. Speaking of bottlenecks, um, we're looking at one. It doesn't matter what resolution we're picking here, the performance is basically the same. Putting in a, a faster video card, like a 4080 to try and get better performance out of this processor is just a waste of money. In fact, the 3080 Ti I'm using here is a waste of money in this build. A new way to show that is GPU busy, a metric that has recently been introduced by Intel and I can show it here. These bars represent how long the GPU was rendering for each resolution. The higher the resolution, the more work there is for the graphics card to do. That's pretty typical and what we expect. Here again are the millions of pixels per resolution. We just saw the average frame per second using this Ryzen 2700, and it didn't change by the resolution, even though the GPU workload changed. That means the GPU is spending most of its time sitting idle, waiting for instructions that are not arriving on time. This is what a CPU bottleneck looks like. Even at 4K, we can see that the GPU workload increased to 48%, but there's still plenty of headroom for the GPU to deliver that work on time for the CPU, the work that the CPU is asking of it. Therefore, the GPU is just sitting there twiddling its thumbs, <laughs> waiting. So let's upgrade the processor. Let's compare the 2700 to an Intel 9700K. When we look at the average frame per second, there is a big jump on the green bar representing that Intel processor. That's a 50% improvement right there across all resolutions, proving that this Daytona torture test really benefits a faster CPU. But notice how there's a more of a slope going from the single ultra wide down to the triple 4K. This suggests that we're now leaning into the GPU a bit more. Let's take a look at the GPU busy times. Comparing the orange tw Ryzen 2700 to the green Intel, we're seeing that the Intel is able to ask of and receive more data from the GPU. And that increase in workload to the GPU is especially noticeable at triple 4K. The closer these bars reach 100%, the closer the CPU is to completely satisfying the GPU's capacity to do that work. On the opposite end, the closer these bars are to 0%, the more time the GPU is spent idling or being unutilized in that workload. Okay, let's move on to all of the processors now at the varying resolutions at Daytona. And first we'll look at the average frames per second. This is the most CPU intense scenario I have found so far with iRacing. And at ultra wide screen, the 7800X3D takes the win. It is leading in all three bars, the average FPS, the 1% lows, and the 0.2% lows. The 5800X3D is able to achieve a solid win over the entry 7600 on the new AM5 platform. It also has a significant advantage over the 5600, its little sister CPU on the AM4. The 9700K is able to put in a really good showing here but the Ryzen 2700 struggles. Knowing that this is such a CPU intense scenario, as we increase resolutions, not much is going to change. 4K ultra wide looks similar to triple 1080p, which looks similar to triple 1440p, 
but let's tune back into the GPU busy chart before we look at 4K. At triple 1440p, only the 7800X 3D and the 13700K are able to keep this video card busy during 80% of each frame. But when I increase the resolution to triple 4K, seven of the eight processors are able to keep the GPU busy on average 80% of the time or more. When we look at the 7800X 3D, only about 4% of this one lap is the video card waiting on the CPU. So what does this look like from an FPS average perspective? The 7800X 3D is still leading, but the chart has significantly flattened out in the mid-pack. So even though we know this is a CPU intense scenario, we're beginning to see this 3080 turn into a GPU bottleneck. But Daytona nighttime, 50 cars, this, this is an extreme example. Let's look at these processors in a more normal situation with iRacing. So how about Red Bull Ring and a Super Formula? This track has been around for two and a half years now on iRacing. It has received several optimizations. It has some far terrain, but what's great about it is the point of view of the driver. At a few instances, he looks back towards the interior of the circuit and where the grandstands are here. Um, and that is actually going to be impactful on the CPU. But we only have two mirrors to worry about here, and at this instance, we've got no clouds in the sky. It's a sunny day. Revealing our first results of ultra-wide, we see a victory for the 13700K over the 7800X 3D. Surprisingly, we see the 7600X uh, overtake the 5800X 3D by a sizable 10% margin. We also see the 9700K show its age against the 5600 uh, with uh, what, about 14% deficit. Going to 4K ultra wide, we see the performances relatively the same between all the processors. And then at triple 1080p, uh, again, it's the same. A bit of a blemish here for the 7800X 3D with its 0.2% uh, minimums. I thought this was a uh, testing error or an anomaly, but we actually see this consistent through the next two results. So I'll keep an eye on this with future testing. When I push the resolution to triple 1440p, we see the chart flatten out again like we did at Daytona at 4K. This time it's at a much lower resolution and we're seeing a GPU bottleneck. Both X3D processors leap up the charts and I don't know why. <laughs> if you have some theories, post it in the comments below. When we look at the GPU busy chart for triple 1440p at Red Bull Ring, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing a GPU bottleneck and it makes me wonder is there an advantage to that 3D cache in trying to resolve a GPU limitation? And when we go to triple 4K, uh, <laughs> the chart is very flat and a bit confusing. I mean, the 7800X 3D is still in the lead, showing 0.2% lows to be the worst of the bunch. And the results are bunched. All these processors performing very similarly because we're definitely confronted with a GPU limitation here. If we look at the GPU busy chart at triple 4K, um, <laughs> yeah, that's what a GPU bottleneck looks like. If I had something like um, an RTX 4090 to throw at this, maybe the chart would look different, uh, but certainly with a 3080, this is, this is what you get. Okay, let's try to draw some conclusions out of all of these benchmarks. And I think we'll start with the X3D cache. The 7800 and the 5800X3D, that extra cache really helps with intense uh, scenarios. Lots of cars, buildings, lighting. 
So if you are a racer that does endurance events, maybe you're the, have the responsibility for your team of doing that first lap, you're going to have a higher frame per second, a smoother experience on those first few laps with an X3D, but there are still going to be dips on those first few laps. If you are running a single screen, maybe it's an ultra wide, a six core processor is probably enough in most scenarios to get that 144 Hertz. So if G-Sync and FreeSync is working with you to smooth out the dips that we see here, an entry level last generation six core might be good enough for you. Looping back to the official specifications listed on the iFreeSync website, uh, I think it's a bit misleading. A high-end eight-core processor like a ninth gen just doesn't really cut it anymore. You can, in normal conditions, um, see a big advantage just by going new or newest generation six-core. And we see that here with the 9700K from Intel versus the 7600X. Finally, let's talk a little bit about GPU Busy. Hopefully my explanation of it made a bit of sense. I'm still wrapping my head around it. It is a new metric. And I think what we saw is a mid-range card. It's debatable what that is nowadays, but it starts to become a bottleneck at triple 1440p. At 4K, listen, if you got, the, if you got those screens, you need the fastest video card you can afford. So that's the analysis. I hope you found it useful or at least insightful. Please add, uh, ask some questions in the comments um, and like and subscribe. I want to do more analysis like this. I'm especially interested in how uh, Radeon cards line up now with um, VR and triple screen. So I'd like to do that kind of work. So show some support and let's get it done.